Yeah, you know, finding the optimal price to date seems to be a mystery. That's why brand managers turn to insights departments and insights turn to agencies. The process takes weeks or months and can eat huge budgets. The consequence for most products is no proper pricing research is conducted. If pricing research is conducted, it requires an outside partner to walk you through the complex land of measuring willingness to pay. A new technology called implicit price intelligence claims to solve the problem faster, easier, cheaper, and foremost more accurately. The University of Australia took it to the test and compared conjoint Van Westendorp Gabo Granger with the implicit pricing intelligence technology. In this webinar, we report on the findings and how implicit pricing intelligence can be applied in practice. So please, Frank, take over. Take over, take, take it home. <laughs> take it home. Yeah, I love, can you tell me again, democratizing? <laughs> democratizing i have it no i have big problems as a german to pronounce this democratizing so you don't like uh democracy i love democracy i love democracy so so i do but in germany it's it's more easy to to say democracy is very easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only two german tongue cool yes. uh still put some people coming in but uh all who came in new uh we just started uh wolfgang intro gave an intro so i even um prepared an agenda so you know wait a minute where's my agenda <laughs> uh so obviously um there is no agenda <laughs> so i can tell you what the agenda is so first we i like to uh illustrate a bit one, two slides, the, the problem we are facing. Uh, second, I would like to um, really dive deep into the study, university study, comparing different methods. Um, and then I, I will like to demo, um, demonstrate uh, a new tool which uh, uses implicit pricing intelligence. And uh, we summarize uh, everything up. In between, we love to have some interaction with you. We we have some some polls, uh, so anytime you feel free to put your question in the Q and A field. If you want to chat with your colleagues, use the chat. If you have questions to me or to Wolfgang, put it in the Q and A. Okay, so here we go. What's the problem? Mm, wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Actually, I am a little bit concerned whether or not these are the right slides. I think kind of the right slides. And even here's the agenda. Look at that. Wonderful. So no further delay. Problem. Scientific study tool demonstration conclusion so market research for pricing is needed when uh, why i'm asking this question of course you can do pricing eventually if you have sales data um yeah and pricing data and eventually you analyze those data so but actually you need market research when you have a new product because you have you don't have data for that or you you change your packaging in a way that it may uh seem to be a different product and or you have you want to use promotion levels that have not happened in the past before so if you if you you use new promotion levels you actually you don't know how the market will respond or you may need market research if you have actually no comprehensive sales data. And that's uh, what we see with clients, any mid mid size or smaller brands, uh, for instance, consumer brands, 
they cannot afford those GFK or Nielsen market sales data. So they cannot analyze and, and find out what the price elasticity is. Um, so, but I actually, I would like to know uh, how is this with you? So uh, let me quickly start a poll here. Um, I launch it now. Does your company has actually or and detailed market sales data, e.g. from GFK or Nielsen. So just quickly run yes or no. If you are an agency or if you are um, an, an, a consultancy, just assume a typical client of yours. Okay. We just wait a few. Uh, so half of answers are in. Don't think too much. <laughs> Just be, let your gut speak. That's probably mostly the right answer. So I give you 10 more seconds because still one third didn't answer, but okay, I, I leave it free to you. So the result is oh answers coming in it's pretty interesting that 70 percent say they have no sales data so that's that's interesting probably that's um the type of people who are actually interested in those webinar in this webinar but yes, that's a problem, right? So if you don't have sales data, you cannot run pricing modeling on it, right? So you need market research even on the existing products because ma the market changes, pricing, uh, inflation, and so forth. So obviously you, you are interested in um, a market research to find out uh, the price or the willingness to pay of customers. So what kind of methods do we use and, and what's the problem with actual today's methods? So there are three problems, actually. First, you need an expert. Uh, typically, it's not that easy to run a conjoint or even to interpret a, a Van Westendorp um, price sensitivity DVD meter. That's what actually even in agency market research agencies there is one or two people who do the stuff and all the others are not comfortable with running and setting up in a conjoint and interpreted it uh, correctly second all those research takes a lot of time takes weeks right you need to if you have done a conjoint yeah there's a lot of communication going on uh to finally have it set it up analyze it to charts and so forth and it's expensive i mean expensive is relative but actually it's yeah conjoint studies typically cost 10k or 100k or whatever yeah but there's no way to can you you can have it for one one thousand euro so it's it's a considerable budget required <clears throat> and actually low validity i mean the question is uh you may wonder how huh? conjoint is is great so why i'm telling low validity um so we we will look in the in the in the study later on and of course conjoint proved in certain certain uh, studies to work well but if you are interviewing pricing experts pricing consultants they tell you bluntly that this is not um uh, there there is it's a often a stretch to to really make it uh make it work for the market we will look into the, those details a bit more later on. Um, so we have a problem, Houston. What do we do? Uh, actually, we can solve the problem if we think 
or if we consider how buying decisions are made. And everyone knows this book already now from Kahneman. Buying decisions, even in B2B, are mainly driven by system one, basically by the gut instinct, by the by attitudes, by things which are instantly available by the by the customers. So if we want to find a proper price, we need to untap the instinct, the the implicit knowledge. Uh, system two is, is interesting too, but without analyzing system one, uh, the validity will suffer. So what kind of techniques are available for measuring the implicit? So first, we mention here conjoint because in some way it's implicit because you give the, the consumers a complex choice task, which are actually un impossible to solve rationally. It's The whole analysis is built on the assumption that basically the uh, consumer does a, con uh, a rational choice, but actually why it works is different. It works because people are so mentally overloaded that they use their gut to decide. And at, at the end, you can measure somehow which, which features contributed what to the gut. So in some way, it's an, it's an implicit measurement too. There are other methods, EEG, for instance, it's basically... Uh, measuring the brain waves and the, the electric um, stimuli in, of the brain, the activation of the brain, and can basically understand, yeah, uh, uh, what what prices does with our brain, and it can find out that at a certain point, uh, yeah, the we have a hard time to decide, yeah, you know, whether or not it's uh, we should we should dismiss or buy, or buy it and right? that's that's an interesting um, approach for instance called uh, neuro pricing which can also be done with fmrt which is a different uh, magneto magneto based method to measure brain activities but both of those methods have of course uh, the downside that you need to invite people into the lab and to measure them. So it involves some, some additional, some minimal costs. So it's therefore not much cheaper, if any, than conjoint. So and then there is an, the implicit association test, EIT. The implicit association test is a test from psychology <clears throat> and it builds on measuring the reaction time to stimuli. Because, yeah, as Kahneman states, um, answers which come fast are already existing associations. And answers which are a result of thinking, of a rationalizing, takes time. There's a minimum time which you need to rationalize. And you can you can measure that, and you, with that you can actually, um, yeah, induce whether or not an answer is valid in in terms of has been already in association, has been already in the mind of the customer or not. <clears throat> this method also has some downsides, but it has the beauty. You can do that online and you can do that with very low uh, transactional costs. Yeah. So it takes a few minutes, one, two minutes to do it uh, in an online survey. So the costs going down very much. And basically, what we at Super Tools did was taking this basic approach and optimizing it. So there are some biases in the in this approach. For instance, if you simply use it, show the product and the price and ask, want to buy it or don't want to buy it, expensive or not expensive, then you still have 
some some issues. Uh, first, uh, consumers are a little bit re reluctant. Uh, second, um, sometimes the consumers don't need it now, but would buy it in the buying this, um, in the buying state. They would buy it. Yeah. And also the answer is different whether or not the person already have a brand experience and, and other context factors. So what we did is we changed the implicit association test used items that are not directly staying the purchase intention, uh, purchase decision and use also uh, the context variables, uh, context factors I mentioned and use artificial intelligence, machine learning to predict buying intention for every uh, price point. Right, so there is some uh, magic in the back uh, in the machine room, uh, which leads to the fact that it's better, easier, faster, and has much lower costs than conventional methods. Uh, this is a uh, fast claim here, but that's why actually the University of Svalia was interested whether or not this is true. So. Professor Axel Lippold wanted to take it to the test. So he ran on 13 different products. Uh, he ran um, the implicit price intelligence, a conjoint, uh, Van Westmob and Gaba Granger method. So each measured by 100 respondents. For, for conjoint, it was, I think, an average 13 choice tasks per respondent. But the conjoint was set up in a very simple way, just the brand and the price, which is uh, the most simplest way to use conjoint. But there are quotes uh, even from uh, from the leading uh, conjoint software, uh, Sortus, saying that it's still appropriate to do that. And we did, did that because uh, Typical consumer brands would exactly want to do that because the, the chopping, chopping off your product into features is, is a process which takes a lot of time. And when it comes to pricing, it's not what, what you're interested in. You are interested in that when you op want to optimize the product, but when you just want to know the best price you don't want to do that yeah? you just want to test it and want to know what's the best price so in this regard um in this study um conjoint was used in a, in a in a simple way so let's quickly look at some key findings um and this is a key finding regarding um the Van Westenop price sensitivity meter. So what uh, they found in across those products is that the optimal price um, uh, of Van Westenop is not really the optimal price. Let me explain. Uh, for Van Westenop, uh, there is a rule when uh, the curve of uh, too expensive and too, too cheap, when they cross, when they're minimized, there is your optimal price point, which is here the left thing here. Yeah. But if you take uh, the demand function, which you can derive uh, from the exercise as well, and you uh, basically subtract the price, you get the, the profit curve. And in this, uh, yeah, oftentimes, basically, on basically in any time, there is no relation between those numbers, and there there is actually this is not a surprise because actually, if you have products which have uh, cost of goods sold, the optimal price must consider the costs. Otherwise, um, it's it's just uh, be. A matter of luck whether or not you, you meet that 
So that's, of course, considering that you want to optimize the profit and not the, not the sales. Second interesting learning regarding conjoint was in this setting, with this simple form of conjoint, actually the demand prediction were uh, did not meet face validity. Yeah, you see on the left, uh, typically you would think that lower, higher prices, lower demand, but actually it, it uh, resulted nearly for every product in a kind of a zigzag. So um, this doesn't mean that in general conjoint would uh, produce nonsense, but in this study, it actually did not produce a reliable uh, demand function. Uh, but for sure, uh, we cannot say that conjoint is uh, is is not useful because there are many studies proven that it is useful and it is useful for the main application, which is product optimization. When you have lots of features, you want to weigh the uh, trade those off and also want to perform a market simulation and so forth. But we are looking here for uh, at the task of simply finding the best price for a product. Um, good. So, uh, and third learning for Garber Granger. Garber Granger resulted in demand uh, price demand functions. You see it on the left. Uh, often quite parallel to the implicit price intelligence, but this still results in quite different optimal profit uh, profit curves. So the general uh, learning is it kind of underestimates the willingness to pay, which is also expected because it's a rational um, serving method for willingness to pay and typically uh, consumers would like to underestimate that or to hold back they're willing to pay willing to pay maybe also for themselves and this um, turns out to be true but the, even if you kind of uh, have a more flat or a lower uh, price demand curve it's interesting to see that the optimal price can be therefore very different uh, and lastly, actually, when when we look at all those different um, methods, any method has kind of different price points. So oftentimes there is a strategy to basically uh, use many methods and kind of triangulate, uh, triangulate the, the best price. And with this results, I'm not so sure whether or not this is a, it's a good idea. Rather, the study comes to a different recommendation, uh, and recommendation that each of those methods should be used for certain reasons, for certain applications. So beside those learnings and face validity checks, there were some more um, some checks which tested the results against reality. The first check were um, f at five price points. Uh, the the professor checked whether or not the demand uplift after price uh, after promotion, whether or not the uplift was predicted correctly. And across those five, in in four or five of five um, examples, pr uh, implicit price intelligence was far superior in predicting the promotion up uplift. And the, the last check to reality was uh, that for each product and each method gave a demand prediction on the actual price. And then the professor looked at what's the market share today and then correlated those predictions to actual market share. 
And as we here see that um, the implicit pricing intelligence outperformed all other methods. So the study concludes that first conjoint was not successful in this context for opt finding optimal price, but certainly it should be considered and applied when it comes to optimizing pricing and optimized features. Van Westendorp is also useful, not for optimized pricing, but for finding out what is the possible range of prices, because it's it's an open open question, yeah, and you can get any kind of answers there, and therefore it's it's great to find the realm, the the, the space of pricing which is possible. Gabba Granger also was not bad, uh, and therefore, as it is an easy method, it's uh, it's viable for quick assessment. And implicit price intelligence proved to be. Um, superior in, in the predictive quality. So um, with that said, I would like to uh, show you now um, how you can apply the implicit price intelligence. So because as I said, uh, I wait a minute, we implemented um, so can you see this? Yeah. Frank, we have a we have a question here mm -hmm. from Giovanni Roberti. He asks, do you have supporting evidences also for semi durable goods? Durable cars. Yeah, I will show you right now here for uh, the product of Zonos. Zonos was one of the first. Uh, pioneers are running and actually finding the prices for their for their products move and roam which were are the mobile speakers from Sonos and they did use implicit price intelligence uh, basically we are developing this since uh, actually the early forms are, are six years old so we are having it for pilot customers since four years. And now we automated the, the whole setup process so it can be used by anyone. Um, but basically when you are going to um, super.tools, right? And you can log in for free uh, to this tool. You will not have here the studies, so it's an admin view. Basically you, you can start creating a, a survey, step one, uh, creating product tests to it, and then starting and re uh, reviewing the results. So for Zonos, for instance, uh, yeah, we oh, look at that. Basically, first you, uh, you log in, right? And then you need to set up, for, you need to give the category name. And this is how the screener looks like for the panelists. So it will send out uh, and filled out by 100 panelists. And we interview everyone who is a category buyer of this category. Yeah. Um, and with that, the study is set up. And then you can add it by pushing the, this button, add a new product. For instance, move. It's as simple as you have a product name, you copy in the product description, which is basically what you would now find on Amazon when you want to buy a Sonos speaker. That's basically the amount of introduction you think uh, a user, a typical user would maximally read, right? You add the picture and that's basically how the user is introduced to your product. And after this intro introduction, he goes into the implicit association test, which looks like that on, on the right. Basically, he sees a product, a price, and uh, is asked, fits uh, to this product offer. Yeah, basically, whether or not appropriate fits to this price with, with this, um, yeah, to this product. And this 
attribute here it changes yeah these are the the different attributes which we use to predict purchase basically and the user has its fingers on the one and zero and you simply say yes no and the the attribute changes and and the price is changing after two minutes it's got it's done right uh, the and here in this setup, you need to define those seven price points. Uh, and the form helps you basically that you are simply start with three price, price points, the, the price point you would expect to be the optimum. Uh, then what you expect to be the maximum possible on the minimum possible. And finally, you, you have the option to edit those suggested seven price points so now it's set up yeah and you can start uh running the field so we already did that so let's look at the results um so basically what you see here the orange curve is a demand prediction per price okay and the profit prediction depends on what the cost of goods sold, what's the um, the tax, because in Europe, the tax is a part of the price. So in the US, you would need to put this to zero always. And, um, and the retail margin, because um, yeah, basically this is what you need to give the retailer right so and if you have said that and basically you can simulate with the, if you don't know exactly the costs uh, try out the range right in this regard um 399 is always optimum and that's what sonos did they priced it 399 uh, and the same happens with rome the other speaker so in short, it takes five minutes to set it up. Uh, you start it, we run it through, through for consumers, we run it to panel and you have this dashboard to... Frank, another another one is, is asking how, how would think about applying this in B2B environments? Yeah, so we have applied it in B2B several times. Uh, so... And uh, we actually have a B2B module when you go on our website. Uh, and basically what changes is the, is the first step where you, you don't def uh, define or basically the category where we reach out to panel. But for B2B, mostly uh, there is no standard panel uh, available. Instead, you simply upload a customer or prospect list with emails. And then we send out an an uh, invite with an, a survey link. And it's actually uh, valuable for B2B if your product is not a pure commodity and if, if it's a standardized product which has lots of customers. Yeah, so that's why, because we need at least, we, we want to have 100 answers. I mean, for B2B, even with 50 answers, you can have... Uh, good results and yeah you can you have seen the the product description yeah there you can have a picture and a reasonable long text so you can even uh, test quite complex products that's it's so in short yes it's used in b2b context another one is asking what kind of sample do you use so we are um connected with a global uh, B2C sample, a panel. Um, so globally leading panel where we have millions of uh, people who are several times a year do surveys. And uh, we find by a screener, we find out those who are category buyers and we ask them for their purchase intention. But I have uh, um, more to say because would like to conclude. 
maybe maybe even we have a little uh one more a poll here to make because uh here we we uh, the the study mentioned the different um the different methods all right so which of those methods do you apply that would be interesting to us quick answer now uh which and if you are an agency yeah you know if you're a consultant also um okay 30 33% answers so we need more Wonderful. We nearly, nearly everyone. So we need 50% answers. We need more. I give you 15 seconds. Okay. So end of poll is no. So basically nearly 60% is uh using conjoint even 27 percent using implicit intelligence today uh which is great uh and and i would be interested in in what kind of solution are you using if if you're not using supra which kind of solution are you using um and yeah that's that's quite interesting that nobody used Gobble Granger. Um, cool. So let me um, let me share my screen to summarize here the thing, and then we dive into more Q and A's. Uh, yeah. So Sonos, of course, the example. The CEO was was impressed because it worked product launch very successful um so we introduced uh the webinar with the problem of actual market research uh methods for price willingness to pay um and maybe we do a very last poll here um because i would like to know whether or not you agree on those uh yeah yeah so which of those apply to you let me launch it i would like to know that uh pro does it uh, you can you uh, say everything yeah you can um agree to everything so which applies to you pricing research requires the customer inside department or kind of some experts you know not everyone can do it Second, uh, research takes weeks, not uh, not days. Um, third, price pricing product research costs around 10K or more and not uh, thousands or less. And last, you are not yet fully convinced about the validity of existing uh, existing technologies. So please tick on everything which you agree. Um, and then we Okay, cool. So I 10 seconds and I'll maybe maybe give you another 10 seconds. So nine eight seven six four five three two one we have a lift off okay share results yeah so uh six of ten agree that it's purely expert um owned and exactly this is why this webinar is called democratizing yeah uh and also yes 
uh, more than half agree that they are not fully convinced about the validity of existing product. And that's obviously uh, why you were interested in, in this webinar. So to summarize that, with um, the implicit pricing intelligence, we are not uh, we are not required to involve experts anymore. Every brand manager, every product manager can do that, can set it up himself and can interpret the results. You can get the results in days, not weeks. Actually, uh, a product test can be as low as 500 euros or US dollars and not 10,000 or more. And this method, which is easy, fast, and inexpensive is also a winner in scientific studies. So obviously, that's the takeaway. It's obviously an option um, to apply it, right? So with that being said, I'm very happy to get uh, answer more questions. Uh, in any ways, uh, feel free to reach out afterwards to me, Frank at Super Tools or Wolfgang. Yes, we have, we have a lot of questions here. Wonderful. So, six, seven. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I start with number one from Sasha. He asks, please discuss how could the price optimizer be applied in the best possible way in times of inflation, such as now? Best possible way. My God. The very simple. Use it and apply it in a short a succession yeah so basically inflation means the willingness to pay changes so you should she should basically run it and then apply it in a in, regularly yeah if you have an inflation of 10 percent, you should do it at least once a year uh on the same product and uh, the measurement and the application should be closely linked yeah, should be um and also it it is also interesting to also look at the willingness to pay to to competitors then anonymous is asking does ipi work SaaS subscriptions or other products with no cox variable costs yeah so it's it is a software as a service yeah you can log in right now for free and basically any uh any product test oh, any test yeah. yeah i think the question is um ipi mean he, he's he asked if the implicit price intelligence tool if the tool works for subscriptions as products with no cocks and variable costs as, of, I think he asks if, if, if um, yeah, yeah sure if, if you can choose it, it, yeah, yeah of course you simply put the co cost to zero uh, and then uh, it's yeah it works the same way um, yeah yep. you simply Pete, put the cost down Peter mm -hmm. is asked Peter Oms is asking can you limit the participation of respondents to to one country yes that's that's standard yeah so we only reach out to uh, either typically a country uh yes peter also says but i think it's a comment that he uses regression as well with nielsen data mm -hmm. i think it's a comment or it's a, it's a comment it's and a... that's of course if you have nielsen data you can uh try to um learn the price elasticity from this data yeah um regression is of course a quite a simple way to do it because it has this rigid assumptions of linearity independent of drivers and and just direct effects so it would be a different topic but still it's better than uh, correlation but uh, also you are limited to the price range which has been on in the market right so there are some limitations 
but sure, it's it's worthwhile to use this data as as good as you can. Um, yeah, Peter also asked, what is the cost to participate for one product? Um, so basically, the question is, how uh, what's the cost to run one product at Supra.tools, right? Yes. Uh, so you can see that on on the website, typically, typically users. Uh, customers buy packages, credit packages. So basically one price test uh, is one credit and packages starts with 10 or 30 pack, uh, credits. But you can also just buy one credit, so one test, which is 900 US dollars. And if you pay, if you buy 10 or, or 30, I think it's going down to 500, right? Yes, yes. and the, the panel costs are included. Yeah, including pen. Uh, yeah, and this is also the question: What is um, the size um, of this panel? How many people are asked? Uh, one hundred people. Uh, we ask one hundred people. This gives us very robust results. Um, because we ask, yeah, several questions for one price point. We ask actually four different. We do four different reaction tests. Um, so we can. And then with machine learning and the context variable, we can really clean out the noise from that. Okay. And someone is asking, is the, the deck you presented um, available? Um, yeah, we can make it available. So okay. and this recording will be shared as well. And, some, and someone else is asking, are you really claiming that we do not need conjoint anymore? No, I never claimed that. So... Uh, Again, uh, conjoint is is great for product optimization. But basically, for the context, we believe is the most actually the most common one uh, for the situation that you want to know the best price. You you are not interested in the features anymore. You just want to price it. And uh, for this situation. Um, yeah, the implicit price intelligence is not not just easier, uh, cheaper. It's also better. And Stevie is asking, please explain how the panel is selected in B two B space. So in B two B, we we do not use a standard panel. Yeah, so we could reach out to panel, but in most cases, you need to research whether whether or not there is a panel which has enough. Uh, Respondents in it, yeah. So that's why the standard is actually in B two B that the client, so you, is uploading a contact list. So still, it's possible to reach out to panel, but this is a uh, an extra manual work where we basically need to send emails to uh, panel providers to find out whether or not this particular audience is available somewhere. Yeah, but but Frank, we are we are doing it. Um, do you remember this case with this super special telecommunication provider, who is who is so so? I was astonished how easy it was to find this super specialized target groups, and yeah, but but it makes some. We can. It is not possible to to make it for this small money. So this have to be calculated. Uh, special or you use your own your own customer base or your own mm -hmm. lead base whatever you have on on uh yeah people. that's what i want to say uh, uh the super tools is, is super easy you set it up you run it you have a data but with b2b uh, uh it is possible to reach out to panels but we don't know what the costs are and whether or not yeah. uh, there are panels for that particular uh, audience um, so basically, this is an extra work, which is not basically yeah. self-service. Yeah. And Rutger is asking: Is there any survey bias? Oh, every every survey has a survey bias. Yeah. So, which which kind of survey bias are you thinking of? Let me see the chat. So in in general, yeah, the surveys try to be most biotic, so basically realistic as possible. But actually, it's not. 
it's not the, the reality, right? It's it's a simulation of the reality. Uh, but what we what you measure is the attitude users have, and the attitude basically it is a condensation of the the market knowledge they already have. And research shows that this is basically the main determinator for buying decisions. But still, there are other things if your product is not in a shelf or some suddenly is right down at the shelf or a new great pro, uh, competitor is coming on the market and was not in the brain, user's mind so far, things change. So you need to... Uh, Rut yeah, uh, Rutger is, 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 is writing more details. He's, he mm -hmm. asked that he means that respondents are more or less price sensitive than the population. No, we, we are interviewing the category buyer, which are representative for the people you are for your market. Um, and there are no evidence I am aware of that those are more price sensitive than, um, than the, the true buyer. Okay, Stevie is, is asking back to B2B, what advantage does SupraTools offer over pre-existing customer focus groups? Uh, oh, many. <laughs> so uh, focus groups is a great qualitative tool for you to understand their, their thought process. Uh, but actually it's not a quantitative method to understand the price demand function. It, it is also very, uh, very biased by uh, interviewer bias, by the, the people who are sitting there who speaks first. So that you even, you do not get any representative results out of it. It's really more for you to understand the thought process, to get ideas, but you need to have a quantitative step after that to understand the, the price demand function, which you need to actually to, to find the optimal price. So it's it's not the same. It's, it's a research pro process, which is important or interesting, but comes first. Yeah? Qual, explorative, quant, which is the price intelligence and someone else is asking how do you consider the competitive landscape um that's an interesting point that um, uh, you could say hey in conjoint i have the, uh, the competitive landscape um actually what uh, what's interesting is that the general competitive landscape is already in the mind of the customer. And the, the, the association, the implicit association is, is basically a condensed form of all those market knowledge. You could say, hey, but at the, at the shelf, it could, could be different. That's true. Yeah. So a certain shelf could have different competitors and different pricing. Uh, yeah, and but we don't know, and you also don't know it if you do a market simulation with with um, with conjoint, right? So instead, the the idea and the concept with implicit price intelligence is that you measure the typical price de demand function and assume that everything else is kind of multiplying it. So if you have a better distribution, it multiplies. If you have a better shelf representation, it multiplies. If you have less alternatives, it multiplies. But actually the optimum stays the same. I have another question. We are an agency. Can we use the tool in our existing questionnaires? Yes. Uh, I think next week or so we're launching in the step one 
uh, for agencies where, where basically you are getting a link and you copy in your redirect link. This means within your survey, the response is led to the Supra survey and we give it back to you. So, and you basically can interview as many people you want because the panel uh, is, is yours. So you, you pay the panel anyways. Um, yeah, so that's, that's doable. No more questions here. Yeah, this was it. This, yeah, we are, oh, we are over time, huh? Yeah. That's why we need to close before the full hour of webinar is, is done. Still a lot of people are in. So again, uh, I'm very pleased to see so many uh, people here in the webinar. Um, you will get a recording. Uh, please send out all the questions you have. And we are running more webinars uh, next year. So please join again. Also, if you want to have, are interested in a particular topic, uh, give us your, your ideas. So we are really eager to talk with you. Thank you. Bad. Peter's, Peter, yes, a lot of greetings to Peter. He is thanking us a lot. <laughs> great. Peter, have a great day. All mm -hmm. others, enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.